Good evening, and welcome to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. My name is Megan Robertson, and I work at the Education Department here at the Frist. Thank you for joining us for this evening's Curator's Perspective, Art and War, Propaganda, Conscience, and the Power of Objectivity, presented by the Frist Center's Chief Curator, Mark Scala. Mark is the organizing curator of the exhibition Steve Mumford's War Journals, and he also first proposed the juxtaposition of Steve's, ex excuse me, of Steve's exhibition of images of contemporary warfare with the etchings of Francisco Goya. And I encourage you to visit both exhibitions, The Disasters of War and Steve Mumford's War Journal in the upper level galleries. We have two more programs that are highlighting these exhibitions coming up next month. On Saturday, May 3rd, we'll present Connecting Conversations, Goya's Disasters of War, with Dr. Andre Zamora and curator Katie Del May. That's at noon on May 3rd. And then on May 16th, that's a Friday evening, at 7 p.m. here in this auditorium, we'll screen the documentary Restrepo. The staff of the Frist Center has found the pairing of these two exhibitions very inspiring, and we've worked with a wonderful group of community partners to develop public programs that raise challenging questions about the history of art and war. This particular lecture grew out of a presentation that Mark gave to a focus group of military veterans, activists, and educators to help us understand both Steve Mumford's and Francisco Goya's work in their larger art historical contexts. The Frist Center thanks the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their continued support of our exhibitions and programs. We would also like to thank SAFE, Soldiers and Families Embraced, for their support of our volunteer and adult programs surrounding both exhibitions. Thank you, Mark, for tonight's lecture. How many of you have seen the exhibitions upstairs? Excellent, good, you all get an A. It's a, it's a difficult subject. War is a really tough thing to talk about. Um, I've never experienced it myself, um, other than vicariously. But when talking to Steve Mumford, and after working on the Goya project, the, the, the biggest I think question that arose is, what are these images for? Why would we want to look at them? What happens to us when we do look at them? How do we feel? How do they, how do they change the way that we think about the world? And that's something, of course, that we really want to do at the Frist Center. We, want, we do want to help people see their world in new ways. And war is a very convulsive experience. It's all about change, about transformation. I think every one of us, if we were to think back to uh, in our own lives or in our families' lives, would we even be here if it weren't for some war or another? I know I certainly wouldn't be. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a devastating force, but it is also a force that that was instrumental in the construction of society as we know it. But it's something that we don't always like to look at, we don't always like to talk about. Uh, the images upstairs are tough. And the things I'll talk about tonight are, can be fairly tough too. So if your stomach is a little off tonight, you know, you may think about looking at the, uh, at the MFA Boston show instead. So hopefully, hopefully your stomachs are, are, uh, are on on target tonight. It won't, be, it won't be so painful, but I think the idea is to really look at both Steve's work and Goya's work in a larger context. You know, what, again, what are these images for? What is the history of art related to war? Why in the past have we made art related to war? What has it accomplished? What, has it, what purpose has it served? And again, why do we do it today? What's different about the art today? So one of the things that we'll, we'll really look at, at art in terms of its instrumentality, in terms of how does it instruct us, how does it, how does it reinforce one point of view over another point of view? Is it propaganda? Is it the art of conscience? Or is it simply a document, simply a blank slate, a tabula rasa onto which we can project our own meanings. And of course this happens when I asked Steve about, about his work and about how people responded to his work, Steve Mumford. 
He said, you know, those people who are opposed to the war think of my work as pro-war propaganda because it's showing our troops in a very favorable light. Those people who are in favor of the war, who, who supported our invasion in, in Iraq and, and into Afghanistan, think of my work as being kind of lefty, you know, because it shows the negative aspects of war. Look at all these images of, of traumatic injuries, of war injuries, of suffering. Um, and, and there's a risk that that might turn public opinion against the war. And so, to me, that means that he's very effective as a reporter because, again, people are projecting their own meanings and their own readings into his work. From the earliest times, images of war have cemented national or racial consciousness. They've celebrated kings. Of course, they're also commissioned by kings and established for posterity the identity of a people, a people as mighty, as aggressive, as imperialistic, often with the idea of having received power through their gods. So this is kind of the tradition against which we're, we're playing today. This is a cast of a relief from the Karnak Temple, and it shows Pharaoh Seti I, crushing the people of Palestine, just destroying the people of Palestine. He's giant and they're tiny, as is fitting for their uneven, uh, unequal uh, stature. The text, as we see above, reveals something about the man, something about Egyptian values, and something about the history and the importance of imperialism as a, as a, a culturally constructive force. And then we'll make a bit of a leap our own pharaoh. No, I take it back. He's not really a pharaoh. Um, but art about our own mythic fathers can teach history or ideals. It can instill pride in military prowess, in risk-taking, in courage. Known to every school child as the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware to surprise the Hessian forces at Trenton, the painting wasn't made in the late 18th century at the time of the event, as, uh, which comes as a surprise to many. It was actually painted in 1851, long after the event had occurred. And perhaps also surprisingly, it was made by a German-American. It was painted in Dusseldorf. It wasn't painted in New York or Philadelphia, painted in Dusseldorf by a German-American who was really thinking mostly not of an American audience. He didn't really need to bolster George Washington's reputation in this country, but he wanted it to be an example for his fellow Germans, his fellow Germans after the revolutions of 1848. He wanted to show them the American example of how you establish a liberal democracy. So one nation's struggle as a model for the future of others. And it didn't hurt Leutz's cause when, when we realized that the Hessians were infamous in liberal German circles for their abuses of power. So Washington surprise attack, uh, doing a, launching a surprise attack on the Hessians had a great and double meaning for the audience in Germany. So these, these messages are not always evident. What the intention of an artist can, change, can, can be changed or, or transmuted. Um, we don't always know what the intention of the artist is. And I think that's an important thing to remember. What ideologies do images of war support? Felix de Weldon's Marine Corps War Memorial, AKA the Iwo Jima War Remor Memorial, conveys the, the American self-image at its best. Courage, teamwork, sacrifice. Adapted from the photograph by Joe Rosenthal, the monument unites the nation in pride at the victory over the Japanese. The work is more about American resolve and patriotism than it is about a particular victory on a small Pacific island. It is a cultural monument of the first magnitude. While it may be the most recognizable, it's not the only defining image of that war in our minds. There are others, what I would call private or psychological monuments, that are not in public places but are etched in our minds and hearts. Some affirm our heroism. Others affirm the justice of our cause. But some haunt our memories in other ways. Images of the aftermath of Hiroshima or Nagasaki show the horror of our actions. The most devastating of these images did not come to public view immediately because our government feared that to do so 
might have led the public to have second thoughts about whether these bombings were necessary. They were published in Life magazine in 1952. And did the subsequent awareness of the enormity of the, destru of the destruction end nuclear war? We haven't had one since but they certainly contributed to the Cold War. After the Russians got the bomb, such images told us that what had happened in Japan could happen here, feeding a growing anti-nuke movement and perhaps pricking the conscience of a nation. Unlike the Iwo Jima sculpture, this photograph could never be our public monument. Once we see it, however, it is etched in our minds as a psychological monument, a reminder that inhumanity can also belong to the victor. The question of why one is a monument and not the other is a question about who we are, what we believe, and how images make us feel. What if memorials helped us remember both the best and the worst in wartime? War is about polarities, and art about war often cultivates ideas of difference, good, bad, just, unjust. War-related art is not easily divided into right and left, despite what Lucy Lepard says. But still, one could argue that there is no neutral zone. And here enters propaganda. This is a loaded term. Unlike pornography, we don't always know it when we see it. We oftentimes shouldn't know it if it's going to be effective. While propaganda is ancient, it's been around forever, it is named in the church's 1622 Propaganda Fide, a religious congregation meant to facilitate missionary work and defend the faith against heresy. <coughs> Governments have always relied on propaganda. In wartime especially, the public needs to be rallied by touting the justice of the cause, the glory of the, home, of the homeland, the horribleness of the enemy. Adapting the model of the church, French revolutionists established groups of apostles and propagators of reason, aimed at the re-education and transformation of the public. Propaganda flowed through newspapers, pamphlets and engravings, caricatures, plays, songs, and monuments. It saturated late 18th century Paris. The need in revolutionary France for an official art led to Jacques-Louis David's anointing by Napoleon as the first painter to the imperial court, effectively the dictator of the arts. Napoleon commissioned David to commemorate his crossing of the Alps to victory at the Battle of Marengo. So this is an image that has all the earmarks of what we expect an official portrait of a, of a conquering uh, a warrior to be, uh, astride the, the um, rearing stallion. Although Napoleon had actually crossed the Alps on a mule, he wanted to be portrayed as calm upon a fiery steed, and David, David complied nicely. The 1850 version by Hippolyte Delaroche is, while after the fact, much more accurate. History is written in the unfolding moment. History as written in the unfolding moment isn't any more reliable than history written in retrospect. Commissioned by a British collector of Napoleana, the 1850 work was really meant as a corrective to the historical record. Although it seems to deflate Napoleon, the contrast mainly shows the later generation's preference for realism over the symbolic clarity of neoclassicism. Interestingly, in other paintings, Napoleon had been portrayed as a messianic character, and one might subconsciously link this later version with Christ's entry into Jerusalem on a donkey, but that may just be my own projection. With our emphasis on generating emotions through dramatic compositions, a sense of swirling movement, strong color, and dynamic instability, the Romantic painters were well suited to stirring passions regarding war. Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People shows his interpretation of the 1830 Paris uprising against King Charles X. Delacroix had witnessed this, he had, by his own testimony, dodged the bullets. But clearly the painting is symbolic, not realistic. The lower part is covered with dead bodies who create a pedestal for the victors. The bare-breasted woman is an allegory of liberty, evoking the revolution of 1789. Delacroix said, I've undertaken a modern subject, a barricade, and although I may, not have fought, I may have not fought for my country, at least I shall have painted for her. 
So how can we see this and ourselves not want to fight the good fight? But what is the cost of fighting the good fight? In Simone Weil's essay, The Iliad, or The Poem of Force from 1940, she writes, violence turns anyone subjected to it into a thing. In liberty leading the people, the dead are stripped of more than their lives, more than their clothes. They're stripped of their, huma of their hum humanity. We empathize with the upright, not the inglorious dead, because otherwise we might think twice about storming the barricades. The downplaying of death and injury, the identification with a heroic warrior, or at least the argument that one's sacrifices are worth it, is central to art that favors war. For the Italian futurists who wanted to abandon the past and embrace modernity, war was a cleansing agent necessary for a culture to transform itself by shedding its baggage, developing new technologies, introducing an aesthetics of vigorous chaos. When World War I broke out in Europe in August of 1914, the futurists Filippo Tommaso Marinetti and Gino Severini pushed for Italy's involvement with the ally on the Allied side, seeing in war the realization of their cult of violence, masculine energy, and machines. Severini's painting, done in 1915, shows an armed railway carriage that has just broken through the German lines and aimed its artillery at the enemy. There's none of the screaming horror of actual conflict. For Severini, the state is a machine. War is a machine fought by people who are machines. If a machine fails, another will take its place, and victory is a matter of mechanics. The actual consequence of the war machine is shown in John Singer Sargent's Gassed from 1919, which shows the aftermath of a, of a mustard gas attack during the First World War. Asked by the British Ministry of Information to make a painting for the Hall of Remembrance, Sargent went to the Western Front in July of 1918, where he witnessed this actual scene. Because of who commissioned it, the British Ministry of Information, one may think of this properly as propaganda. Yet it is also a representation of fact. It can be two things at the same time. The war was over. The painting wasn't really needed to strengthen the resolve of Britons. Yet one role of propaganda is to make people think about the last time as preparation for the next time. Propaganda as a distorting mirror arguably achieved its greatest influence in the 20th century, World Wars I and II and the Cold War. It followed several simple premises, the protection of our families, the duty to home, and the need to destroy the monster who threatens us. Propaganda's master was Hitler, who was convinced by the British success with it in World War I that this was a decisive factor in the, in the outcome. Posters like this had inspired tremendous resolve among the Britons. In shaping the construction of information during the rise of the Third Reich, Hitler placed a premium on propaganda's capacity to sway the common person, the masses, people who were gullible, who weren't sophisticated, who believed the voice of authority, who became the backbone of his power and the support for his aspirations. You can see these are several examples of, of uh, Nazi propaganda, it's really the, the same story. Who is it that we're fighting against? Well, we're fighting against the monsters. We're fighting against the, the inhuman. And what, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for home, for our, for our elderly parents. We're fighting for our children to protect, pr to protect our wives' virtues. And this is how we prepare to fight. But of course, Germany was not alone. Russia, China, Britain, North Korea, the United States, all have long histories of shaping perceptions about war, shaping perceptions about why we defend the homeland, inspiring people to volunteer for service. They still do, we still do this. We look at this, uh, at these Korea examples of North Korean propaganda, we think of them as being completely crude, almost laughable in, in uh, uh, their, their simplicity. We wonder how they could be effective, but of course we're looking, we're talking about a culture that is absolutely controlled, that has no reason to doubt the veracity of these images. Realism itself is oftentimes thought of as an instrument of propaganda. You make things look real, then people will believe that they are real. 
In discussing art and propaganda, the graphic designer Milton Glasser, steeped in the culture of advertising, he invented the uh, I Heart New York uh, uh, logo, um, so he's obviously an expert in this, steeped in the culture of advertising, said, we live in an ocean of persuasion, most of it unrelenting and invisible. Every culture has its own way of indoctrinating its citizenry. In our culture, this occurs through the use of advertising, television, schooling, and the way news is reported. Because it's so difficult to identify. Remember, propaganda is not like pornography. It's a little harder to tell. Because it's so difficult to identify, it becomes essential to question all the beliefs we cherish most. Propaganda is alive and well. In a confrontational media environment, steeped in advertising, the languages of advertising, and the force of advocacy. Such graphic images are still used to, sh to shape public opinions. I don't think it's a, it's a mistake that the word you in the right-hand work in the uh, Daily Star is right next to the British flag. And I don't think that that phrase, BBC put Muslims before you, is accidentally juxtaposed with the uh, f image of Lucy on the right. It's all, it's all meant to stir and, and uh, uh, affect your emotions. Now let's look at another side of it. Let's look at the art of conscience, which says, as Susan Sontag writes in Regarding the Pain of Others, this is what war does. War tears, rends. War rips open, eviscerates. War scorches. War dismembers. War ruins. The cover of Sontag's book is this image, one of Goya's prints from the disasters of war. Working at the same time as David, but in Spain, Goya made the series in response to the war between Bonaparte's regime, whose progressivism he admired, even if he didn't like their brutality in occupying Spain, and the Spanish royalty for whom Goya worked as the, as the court painter, but whose monarchical despotism he despised. Goya doesn't always identify the perpetrators of torture, rape, maiming, and murder. They're just people, like you and me. What would we do? What would we do if we were in the same circumstances? But they're made more brutal by the machinations of war. This was the modern era's first guerrilla war, where men, women, and children united to fight. The totality, the viciousness, made Goya's imagery symbolic of the inhumanity brought out in all wars. After the French were expelled in 1814, Goya approached the government, hoping to earn a commission. He wanted to, in his words, perpetuate by means of, his, of my brush the, no, the most notable and heroic actions of our glorious insurrection against the tyrant of Europe. And so this is the painting, this is one of the paintings that resulted, the 3rd of May, 1808, execution of the insurgents. It had the didactic intent, the scale, the import of a history painting. But the heroic figure, for once, is not a conqueror, but the vanquished. As heroes were often depicted following Christian tropes, the central figure is bathed in light, extending his arms as if in crucifixion, making him all the more symbolic of victimhood, even if in truth, those who were about to shot were actually insurgents. It's the cost of war. In this instance, one might say that the expression of war's consequence is official. It doesn't celebrate victory, but it still functions as propaganda. And perhaps it is the losing side that can best express the horrors of war with the greatest authenticity. There's nothing to fall back upon but pain, no pride, no glory, or appeals to sacrifice. Just the nihilism of fragmentation, physical, emotional, and cultural. After World War I, Otto Dix put his memories of war onto paper in a series of prints. Flares going off at night revealing twisted bodies, skulls, limbs torn apart. Clearly suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder long before such a diagnosis existed, Dix made this series in the 1920s. They're very personal. They reveal the horror, but also reveal what he felt about what combat truly was like. He dreamt about this. These are the images of his nightmares. Dix captured the period's disillusionment and sense of physical, moral, and cultural fragmentation. This painting, also from the early 20s, shows crippled, card-playing ex-soldiers, and their function not just as portrayals of 
people as they were, but also as a metaphor for a disabled society. The veterans are made of artificial body parts. They're human collages that convey how people had been blown apart, physically and culturally, put back together again in a seemingly random Frankensteinianism. One of the great anti-war paintings is, of course, Picasso's Guernica, a response to an atrocity during the Spanish Civil War when the Nazis bombed the Basque town of Guernica on behalf of the forces of General Franco. The Germans wanted to test the destructive capacity of an aerial bombing. Would it be possible to destroy an entire city from the air? Continuing the theme of fragmentation, Picasso chose a black, white, and gray palette and a flat style in which the forms are outlined, giving the work a graphic quality that suggests a newspaper photograph. This association is furthered by the typographic marks on the horse's body. The bull is often to believed to be a symbol for Franco. The horse likely symbolizes the loyalists. With its spiked tongue, its rolling eyes, and screaming mouth, twisting neck, it embodies pure suffering, as does the woman who holds the mangled body of her child. Picasso made the scene universal. There is no indication of modern warfare, no airplanes, no bombs or guns or modern buildings, just archaic elements like spears, horns, and a broken sword. So the message is really bleak. It, be it becomes more than just a response to a particular incident. It is really about war as being at the essence of mankind's being. There's only fragmentation. There's only destruction, death, and fear. It symbolizes, in essence, the madness and the inevitability of war. We know that images of the personal costs of war cause any civilized person to turn away in despair. But do they change anything? Or do they only offer a record of outrage, a voice saying, while we were once blind to the realities, we no longer have that excuse? Susan Sontag concludes her, work, her book by saying that such art really seems to change very little. She says, to designate a hell is not to tell us anything about how to extract people from that hell, how to moderate hell's flames. But she adds, let the atrocious images haunt us. Now let's speak of art that means to document war. Is such work truly neutral, or does it rather offer a tabula rasa, a blank slate upon which one side or another can project its messages? This question becomes very pertinent, as I mentioned, when thinking about and talking about Steve Mumford's work upstairs. So looking at these three images of a firing squad, Goya's very romantic, very manipulative of the, of the viewer's emotions and of, the, uh, of, of light and posture to give one the sense of the sanctification of the, uh, the, I guess, the martyrdom of the figure at center. And then Manet's image of the execution of um, Emperor Maximilian uh, in Mexico. Uh, and that's really shown as almost an, an everyday sort of mundane fulfillment of preordained rule, roles. The dictator is overthrown, the dictator expects to be shot, and those who do it are as casual as if they're taking target practice. Which one is more realistic or plausible as an actual eyewitness account? Um, neither of them probably are eyewitness accounts. And then you have the third image, uh, an, an anonymous photograph taken in Mexico, um, and that's actually, you know, a true execution, very pr probably closer in spirit to the Manet than to the Goya. But it really helps us sort out the question, well, which has more power? The one in which the artist has manipulated and aestheticized something, or the one that is just there? It's just what you see and what you're looking at, and it doesn't call for a conclusion, but we make our own conclusions. Photography has power. It seems factual. One of its first uses in war occurred in the Civil War, when people like Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner took pictures for, pu for publication back home. They caught many aspects of military life, including the aftermath of battles, not battles themselves, as the equipment was too bulky and the processes were too slow to capture combat, not to mention they didn't want to risk their lives. Photography is also effective at misleading people. The photographer is subjective choosing subject matter, framing the composition, often manipulating the image to relay a message. This scene by Alexander Gardner was actually staged. 
To make it, he dragged a dead soldier over, rearranged his body. He even placed his own rifle next to the soldier to make sure that everybody understood the nature of the sniper's work. Why would you do this? Does it make it more compelling to the audience? Does it symbolize in some way the futility and the abjection of the Confederate cause? Is the truth diminished by this little bit of invention, or is there some higher truth revealed by twisting mere facts? These are questions that I think we always have to, uh, the part of what, um, what we have to do as, as contributing members of society is to question the information, the material that's given to us. You know, how is it manipulated? In what way? Special correspondents like Winslow Homer also accompanied the federal troops during the Civil War. For the most part, Homer documented camp life, soldiers resting, marching, playing games, rarely actually in battle. But he also made major paintings that give a perspective on the meaning underlying the conflict. Prisoners from the Front shows a Union general re reviewing three Confederate prisoners. While depicting an actual moment that he witnessed himself, it is as much a symbol of victory and the nature of the relationship between the victor and the enemy combatants as it is a simple document. In the 20th century, American and British combat artists often accompanied the military. Their task was to create empathetic images of soldiers, to give people back home a sense of life in the war zones. They could have done it with a camera, but there's just something very, very immediate and I think very human about using the hand, using the touch. Uh, I, people responded more to this sense of, of the artist drawing this with the, with the immediacy and the sketchiness that we see in front of us. Combat artists were encouraged to paint and draw what they wanted, so they weren't necessarily there to be propagandists, only that it had to be in a recognizable style, and it shouldn't be official portraits of, of officers. And there's a wide range of such imagery, much of it located at the center of military history's military, uh, museum division. These images tell us a lot about the day-to-day -day life of service. Yet however seductive the human touch of paint may be, there's nothing more effective as an instrument of documentation than photography and film. When we talk about the idea of the psychological monument etched within our minds, perhaps the quintessential example is this photograph of a napalm attack in Vietnam. Often misunderstood as proof of American brutality, the attack was made by South Vietnamese who mistook the, the group that the girl was in for Viet Cong. And that's, this is something, as we know, that happens in war often when you can't tell the difference between civilians and combatants. This was not a doctored image. Richard Nixon claimed that it was doctored, but it was really not a doctored image. And it turned public opinion in a way that it is really hard to imagine a painting doing. Today, a number of photographers across the, line, across the line between photojournalism and something deeper, something more profound. One of my favorites is Peter Van Ockmel, a Yale, a Yale uh, grad with a degree in history. He's part of the Magnum Photography Collective, a collective that's been around for decades um, that is a, a loose-knit group of photographers who go around the world, sometimes on assignment, sometimes on their own, making pictures of, of the most, uh, oftentimes the most invisible places to us in the world. His work captures war with insight and compassion, gravity and profundity. It's really quite remarkable. Since 2006, Achtmail has made remarkable images of the war at home and abroad, and, and I just think they're, they capture the fluidity, the emotional upheaval, the energy of the conflict. They never, never seem to be posed or staged. They're just very, very direct and very honest. And this is the sort of photograph that we don't typically see when we open the New York Times or Newsweek. These are photographs that you have to go to, to various artists' websites to see. They're not really the, official, the, the, <clears throat> the officially accepted images. They show us things that we might want to see, we might not want to see. But then there are other photographs that show us things that we wish we hadn't seen. We rarely see things like this in the evening news. The reality of death, the reality of torture, or, or even prisoner maltreatment, um, any, any kind of negative image about the way that we conduct the war. Occasionally a photograph shown on Al Jazeera will make its way to us as for example, the bodies of the American soldiers who had been mutilated in Mosul. But even then, the images were eventually suppressed. General Mark Kimmett said, we're not going to get ghoulish about it. But what critics of the war hear is, 
We're not going to let these images turn public opinion against the war. And of course, graphic images from Abu Ghraib became a huge recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. We saw this with photographs of the American soldiers urinating on the bodies of the Taliban, the enemy using our own imagery against us. So things that start life in one way, images that start life in one way, can quickly become something very, very different from their intent. With today's digital photography and film, the fluidity with which fact and fiction can be blended gives artists powerful tools for relating the intimate microcosm to the broad sweep of history. Megan mentioned that we'll be showing Restrepo, which is an uh, award-winning film. It's, it's a, a pretty amazing and powerful film uh, done in Afghanistan over the course of a year. And, uh, in, this, is, this is as factual as one can make it. But there's also power in blending fact and fiction. I'm going to show you a very brief um, uh, clip from Omer Fast's film, 5,000 Feet is the Best. This is based on art interviews that the artist conducted with a former drone operator. And the, and the drone operator is describing the psychological effects of his missions in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Exploring the ethics of fighting from a distance, the film reminds me of the Italian futurist infatuation with technology, as if it represents a value rather than a tool. For the drone operator, a strike plays itself out on a screen, perhaps half a world away. But when he looks at the consequences of an attack, this distance does not mitigate his feelings of guilt, especially when something goes wrong. In this clip, the actor playing a drone operator imagines a reversal of roles, so we'll watch for about five minutes. If it works. <laughs> Kevin, are you up there? Technology is not behaving itself. Worked perfectly before. Mom, Dad, Johnny, and little Zoe are going on a little trip. Let's say it's the weekend and the family loves the outdoors. Or maybe they need to get away for a while because of problems Dad's having with the provisional authority. Either way, on a bright Friday morning, they pack up the station wagon with food and blankets and good stuff for the long drive. And they leave their house locked for good. So the family drives down their quiet block on a weekend morning on their way to the country. They take a left and a right, stop at the usual checkpoints, present their documents to the occupying forces. It's the same familiar route Dad takes every day of the week when he drives to work. But now he's not driving to work, so instead of driving into town, he gets on the freeway. No, 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 no camera. The drive is long, the trip is boring. Pretty soon everyone is passed out in the car except for Dad. Mom has a map in her bag somewhere in the back, but Dad is a proud, caring husband and he doesn't want to wake her. 
In these parts of the country, it's hard to get lost anyway. There's one road and it snakes along the mountains forever. Inshallah, we'll get there. One hour later, the roads aren't so good anymore. Dad isn't sure if they're lost, but the road looks familiar, so he puts faith in his instincts. The car bumps along at a much slower pace when Dad suddenly sees several men up ahead. They're digging or doing some work on the road. There's also a white pickup truck, something very common to the folks who live out here in the middle of nowhere. Dad slows down even more. It's not strange to see farmers out here, although these guys are not in the field, and there's no sign saying there's road work ahead. The men spot the car and stop what they're doing. They step onto the road and watch as the family gets nearer. Dad can see that one of them has a shovel, and the other two have some working tools, or maybe sticks. Are they shepherds? There are no goats anywhere, no sheep, no camels. The earth on the side of the road is like hard clay. Digging into it with one shovel is no walk in the park. Dad stops the car about 50 feet away. He can see the men very clearly now. The one with the shovel is younger, almost a teenager. He wears a traditional headdress. The other two are older. They're dressed in clothes more typical to tribes from further south, and they're armed with Kalishnikovs. Dad looks at the men. The men look at Dad. He knows who they are and what they're doing, but he doesn't care. It's none of his business. He just wants to be allowed to pass and is not looking for trouble. One of the men waves Dad along, but also holds up his weapon. The other man approaches. Both he and the digger look on with suspicion. Dad edges the car forward. Just then, Mom wakes up. She sees the men and is immediately close to panicking. Dad whispers for her to be quiet and continues. The men are almost in line with the car now. They bend forward, peering in. Fortunately, the kids are still sleeping. Dad passes the men slowly and then steps on the gas. The crisis is over and it's best to get out of here. The men watch as the car pulls away. Dad takes mom's hand and squeezes it. Just then, a shrieking sound pierces the still air, cleaving through it like the cry of a heavenly messenger. The Hellfire missile hits the ground before anyone can react, nearly vaporizing the three men on impact. The pickup truck takes most of the damage, but the station wagon isn't spared. It pulls up ahead and waits, generously, patiently. Time passes. Time is on my side. Seeing the world from above doesn't just flatten things. It sharpens them. It makes relationships clearer. The family continues their journey. Their bodies will never be buried. So uh, this discussion, I hope, creates a context for looking at the works of Steve Mumford, which are on view upstairs. Steve, as you know, is a realist painter whose great hero was Winslow Homer. He was making a painting about Vietnam back in 2002, and he realized that he didn't really have to rely on other people's accounts, on the memories of his parents who had been anti-war protesters. He didn't have to rely on hearsay. All he, uh, what he really wanted to do was to see what it was like himself. So he decided to go to Iraq um, soon, after the, uh, soon after Baghdad had fallen. So he obtained an, um, 
a press pass from artnet.com and found his way over there, paid his way to get to Iraq. He was opposed to the American invasion. He thought it was a misguided response to the attacks of 9-11. But his intention was to go without making judgment, without passing judgment, really to just experience for himself what life was, what life was like there. So he went and he embedded himself with troops but he also, when he wasn't with troops, he walked around the city. He made friends with Iraqi artists, with people in the cafes and the squares, and tried as best as he could to capture the nature of, of the life that he saw. He made a number of, the, of trips to Iraq and then later to Afghanistan over the next 10 years, and his focus was always to concentrate on what he called the spaces in between. It's kind of like the, thinking about the Winslow Homer uh, prints. You know, those were in battle scenes, and I think battle really uh, comprises, you know, five, eight percent of one's time in a war. The rest of the time is people, uh, 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 people are trying to achieve some level of normalcy, some, some means of living their lives and coming to grips with the terrible reality that has unfolded around them. He decided that, I mean, he, he was trained as an artist. He did carry a camera with him for the purpose of capturing additional information, but he felt that it was important to draw, to work slowly. So he would go into a public square, go into, um, uh, go with the troops, and would draw for 40 minutes, sometimes an hour, with pen and ink, sketching very quickly, then taking a few photographs of the scene so he could get the sense of color and light and then go back to his hotel room and finish the work. Sometimes the finished work is simply the sketch itself. And as we saw with the, with the combat artists from World War II, that the, the artist's hand is so important for conveying some sense of the artist's presence. We've heard many people talk about how when they look at one of Steve's paintings, that they feel themselves to be standing there with the artist in a way that they don't feel when they look at a photograph of, of the same type of subject matter. So I think that the, the idea of the slow take, the absorption of information over the course of 40 minutes, when circumstances are changing, a scene might be unfolding in front of you, and so you have to use your memory, you have to use your judgment about, well, what is critical to the telling of this story? We've had many visitors, many veterans especially, who have visited the exhibition. And for them, this documentary nature and, and the, the time that Steve took to make the works made him very trustworthy. He made his, made his stories very much uh, uh, aligned with the stories and the memories that they have of their own. A work like this, is this propaganda? It shows troops tossing candy to scrambling children. And this happened very frequently in the early days of the occupation. It shows American troops in a very positive light. Obviously, they're there, they're making friends, they're ingratiating themselves to the, to the, the young people. Um, they're being generous, and so one could say, well, yeah, this is, this is a propagandistic image. But is it really? It's also a document of a fact. And I think that one of, the, one of the realizations that we all have to have is that as we look back on any series of images coming out of any conflict, say World War II, what we have to do is take the cumulative record. We can't really judge whether one piece is more propagandistic than another piece, one piece is more about truth or fact than another. We can only judge the conflict from the total impact of everything that comes out of it. And, e and even then, it's partial. Every image is partial. Every image is framed, and there's so much going on outside of the frame. And that was one of the things that the veterans talked about and the active military talked about. This work doesn't tell you what happened down the street. It doesn't tell you how they got to where they got. It doesn't tell you necessarily how the parents feel, although his, his uh, uh, written record tells us that. And so the things that are not said Become, it, it becomes an, a, a window onto the things that are not said. Questions about any agenda that Mumford might have had? I think you just put aside when you see scenes like this, scenes of triage, of therapy, of, of uh, men and women who have lost limbs and are undergoing a, a treatment and, and learning how to use their new prosthetic devices at Walter Reed and Brook Army Medical Center. I mean, it's just a purely human expression. It's all about how human we are and how much we can empathize with, with these brave men and women who have lost so much and who are 
really looking at the rest of their lives and what Steve said, they're looking at the rest of their lives and looking at, at their experiences with a degree of optimism that he had not expected. So that I think is, is an extraordinarily powerful thing to observe and, and a great gift for him to give to us. Steve also does more finished paintings, made from a combination of drawings that are done on site, from memories, from photographs. They have the power of history paintings. If you've seen this painting upstairs, Empire, you know it's monumental in every single way. It gives you the feeling of something of great import that has happened, and that great import is mirrored by the great scale of the painting. They have the power of history paintings with realism that assures us that the image can be understood by anyone, just as the old combat artists used to have to do and there's a grand scale that suggests this attempt to find a larger meaning. Empire shows detainees being loaded onto a transport plane for shipment somewhere to Guantanamo or some other, some other facility. There's an unsettling quality. If you looked at the, at the especially the security uh, people, the guards, if you look at their faces, they're uneasy. It doesn't say, this is not just another day in the park. This is not just business as usual, but there's something, there's a recognition of something powerful and meaningful going on beyond simply the loading of prisoners onto an airplane. The title itself, with its implications of modern imperialism by Western governments, think of the relationship between the United States or Britain or France uh, with the Middle East and, and the exploitation of, of the resources of the Middle East, the carving up of the countries of the Middle East. That level of imperialism is brought to mind by the title empire. But it also harkens back to other empires, to earlier empires, to the Christian empire, to the conflict between the Islamic and the Christian uh, uh, religions and the expansionism of each. So it positions this particular conflict in a much greater, much broader story. And I think that that is really the value of a history painting. I mentioned the idea of a psychological monument, and I just thought I'd finish up with a few of Steve's works that really seem to fulfill this notion of a psychological monument. When we would talk to veterans, they would invariably go to one or two of the three or four that I will show here, and they would trigger so many memories. When we look at this painting, this sketch really, of the McDonald's in Kuwait, at the Salem Air, Force Air Base in Kuwait. I mean, we might just walk past this. We might think, okay, it's just the McDonald's, and soldiers are there, of course. It could be at, in, in, uh, at uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base or somewhere else. But this had such meaning for the military. This was the last place that they stopped before going into Iraq. This was the last American, everyday American meal that they would have before going into Iraq. This was the first place they came to when they left. One of the veterans who had suffered from a traumatic uh, brain injury was walking around with his wife and one of the consequences of his injury was that he was unable to call up images in his memory of places that he had been and things that he had seen. And so the real joy of, for him of seeing Steve's work was that it enabled him, it kind of opened the door to be able to speak to his wife about some of these memories. And when he saw this, he said, where that man is sitting on the bench right in the foreground, I sat there. I sat there and I, I looked at the, I ate at the same McDonald's. And that was a very, very powerful thing. The boy that the staff at, uh, um, at the uh, Baghdad ER dubbed Henry. Very, very powerful, powerful image. How can an artist, how can anybody stand there and draw this without just crying? But that's the thing that Steve set out to do. And of course he did have emotions and he conveys those emotions to us. An extraordinary work. He was commissioned by Harper's just as Winslow Homer had been commissioned by Harper's during the Civil War. Steve was commissioned by Harper's to go to Guantanamo uh, Naval Air Base, or Naval Base in uh, Cuba, to cover the trial of a, an accused terrorist. And so he did watercolors uh, of that trial. The work on the right is the cover of Harper's. You can see this series upstairs. And it seems like a fairly benign documentary image. It doesn't seem to con convey any information that could be used ideologically one way or the other. When you look, however, 
at the black rectangles in the room, in the courtroom themselves. Those are not really there. Those rectangles are actually covering information that the courtroom censor decreed were too sensitive for Steve to depict. And I asked Steve, well, what was actually behind those black rectangles? And he said, well, they were actually rectangular doors behind them. So it doesn't really censor anything, but it gives us something. It tells something about the nature of you know, how we're dealing with the consequences of this war. We have Steve going to Iraq and Afghanistan, capturing the day-to-day -day life. We have the history painting like empire, giving the broad perspective. And then we have this as almost a, a summation of, well, what is it all about and what do we do now? The image on the left, I, I, or yes, on the left, the uh, restraining chair, that too could function as a monument for as a psychological monument for understanding and, and knowing and feeling what the what the current situation is in, in in this series of conflicts. And then this, of course, so many of the military when they saw the veterans when they saw this image, it reminded them of the exact same ceremony that they had been to sometimes more than once, sometimes more than three times. It's just incredibly moving. And Steve reported that you know he did the whole painting in one sitting. He didn't take it back with him to his hotel room to finish it up. And he said he was just painting through his tears. So it, it's, uh, it's, an ex it's a powerful, powerful thing. So I'll leave you with this quote by Steve Mumford. Um, it really addresses kind of the larger question of war, images of war, the goodness, the badness, you know, how do you resolve these questions if you're in the military? How do you resolve these questions if you're an artist who's trying to capture the truth of a particular moment? Thank you. Happy to talk, answer any questions. Stunned into silence. Ooh, I'm curious, yes. what was the um, Vimeo? The video? The Vimeo. The Vimeo. The clip. Right. This what was. What was the nature of that? I don't know if you spoke about it or yeah. you just, you know, just something you just pulled out of the Vimeo. This is an artist named Omer Foss. He's an incredibly creative and bold artist. He is. Uh, I think he's Israeli born, but working in, uh, I think he may be working in the United States. I'm not even sure where he's working now. He's one of these global, global uh, uh, figures. A lot of his work has to do with human conflict, with war, with the, the underlying causes, with the, with the terrible consequences of war. And so what he did in this instance, and a lot of his work involves interviewing people who are actually you know, in the military, for example, or like the, the drone operator. Uh, so he interviewed a drone operator and got information about, you know, the technical side of, of that particular business or that particular uh, 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 process um, on the record. And then off the record, the drone operator told him these stories about what it, will, what it was like when you made a mistake what it was like when, when there were civilian casualties that you didn't intend to have, because the drone operator was suffering from a, an extraordinary amount of guilt. And so this is a reenactment of that. And so obviously with the couple and, the, and their children, this was in some ways helping us empathize with the experience by placing it in a context that we would really understand it. So the context being, well, what if this was middle-class suburban America and we needed to worry about drone strikes and we need and what if we were occupied and how would we respond and so I think it's a it's a way just as Goya I think invites empathy just as I think most of the of the artists that I talked about in some way or another invites asks us to put ourselves into the position of the protagonist or the antagonist I think Omar Foss is doing the same thing But I think it's, it, yeah. right, right, right. But it's compelling and it's intriguing. 
And I think in a way, I mean, it's, it's what I talked about, the, the, the slippage between the fact and the fiction. And, and you know, as Picasso and others have said, you know, there's more truth in fiction sometimes than there is in fact. And so moving back and forth. And it does, it is perplexing. And I think that's, that invitation to puzzlement is part of the reason why people can become so absorbed in it. I think if it were a strictly documentary uh, uh, film, it might be a little less of an invitation to empathy than it is. When, when we ask children sometimes, well, what do you think this means, empire? And they look at the painting and they look at the title and they say, the empire strikes back. You know, and so that idea of it being this kind of, and of course the empire strikes back is about this evil empire and the, and the, the good rebels. And so if you look at that painting in that way, and I don't think it's the way that Steve intended it, then we become the evil empire. And the, it becomes perplexing because you don't know. You, you can't rationalize what is like in the Vimeo. You can't rationalize yeah. who is the victim and who is the perpetrator. Yeah. And that's when you get thrown off into that space that's uneasy. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, what size is the Goya painting that was the... Um, I don't remember the exact dimensions, but it's huge. It's very, very large. In, um, in traditional history painting, size equated with importance. Yeah, I think that would have such a, 